I'm Ted Summers. I'm an engineering manager on sensing and perception. I'm going to talk to you today about building Uber's sensory nervous system. I mean, a lot of folks have talked about some of the aspects that go into a challenge like this and sort of the value that it unlocks. But basically, you know, fundamental challenge of Uber, we actually are modeling and optimizing real world phenomena. That's a huge challenge for a lot of reasons. The, the angle of the challenge that my team deals with is the fact that we actually see with sensors. And so the only lens that we have into the physical world are actually pretty noisy smartphone sensors. We get GPS, we get motion sensors, and that's really the only ground truth that we have to interact with. Unfortunately, for anyone that's actually worked with smartphone sensors, they're raw, so we're actually getting accelerometer and gyroscope, which are not directly useful to anyone. They're noisy, so we have to deal with things like different devices actually having different sets of sensors, or even different quality sensors. Um, and then even beyond that, they're enormously high volume, and so we're actually dealing with terabytes of raw data a day. On the other hand, perception makes magic. And so other folks have alluded to this in particular, but the more accurately that we can understand the location and behaviors of agents on our platform, the more we can actually deliver amazing experiences to people. And so my team's mission is to take that enormous blurry data stream and selectively refine it and provide additional semantics on top of it to power the rest of Uber's decision making. We have two sort of broad sub teams that I'm gonna talk about today. The first is location intelligence. And so this is heavy on signal processing and works primarily on fundamental positioning estimates for agents on the platform. The second is sensor intelligence. And so this is a little bit more traditional machine learning we're actually looking to understand who's on our platform, how they're interacting, things like that. So I'll dive into location intelligence first. First thing to talk about is GPS and really quickly how GPS works. So GPS actually consists of a constellation of satellites that are orbiting the Earth, and they're actually broadcasting down to the Earth's surface. So your phone acts as a receiver, and basically it sees some number of these satellites and gets a message from those satellites and uses very precise timing estimates in order to derive what's called a pseudo range. And so that pseudo range tells your phone how far it is from any individual satellite. Once you can see multiple satellites, you can run a process called triangulation, which allows you to use the distance to each of those satellites in order to understand where you are on the Earth. That all sounds great. Unfortunately, cities actually break a lot of the fundamental assumptions that GPS makes. And so buildings act as both shields and mirrors. And so you can see in this diagram, we have both blocked line of sight. So you know, your phone won't be able to observe that particular satellite, or even worse, buildings will actually bounce signals off of them. And so you see the other line, we have what's called a multipath error. So the signal will actually bounce off the building and then to your phone, and your phone will assume it's a straight line distance and think you're actually like on the other side of that building. So if you look at raw GPS and what that looks like on our platform, we can take a typical driver trace. And so this is, you know, a trip in New York. And so you'll see, you know, this is a car and it probably should be on the road. But if you look at the raw data, it's like driving through buildings. So, you know, if we were to tell Owen, hey, this car is like sitting in the middle of this building, I'm not sure what he'd tell you around ETAs or anything, but uh, obviously he's not gonna be super happy about that. So this kind of uncertainty uh, is actually really difficult for us. You know, it makes it very difficult to understand what's an actual efficient decision, you know, what's, what's believable and what's not. It also creates significant issues for things like billing, right? You know, if you were to take, imagine a straight line distance between all these points, that is not the actual distance traveled. And we'd be doing a pretty big disservice to people if we charge them based on that. And so an accurate understanding of where this vehicle actually is at any point in time is super critical to our entire platform. Fortunately, any human can look at this and say that's probably not how a car moves, right? It's pretty easy to say sort of first principles. Um, so we can actually treat this as a, uh, as a hidden Markov model where we actually take the raw input GPS as observations. It's kind of nice. You can then take the uh, noise in the GPS and model that directly in the emission probability. And then we can assume that the vehicle's on a road segment or hopefully it's on a road segment, and take those as the latent states for the actual hidden Markov model. We can then use things like vehicle dynamics to actually constrain the problem. So, you know, if you see a GPS point that's jumping around back and forth, chances are really heavy car, it's not actually moving like that. So that allows us to significantly constrain the problem. And so what we actually wind up doing is taking the red raw GPS data, clamping it pretty effectively to road segments, and then passing that on to the rest of our network. Obviously, you know, uh, a lot more challenges associated with that than high level, like two minute spiel. Significant issues associated with machine learning on sensors in general include issues like lack of labels. So we don't actually know where this car was. We're gonna predict something based on that. We're gonna charge the rider and the driver based on that prediction, but we don't actually have ground truth for any of this. And so going out and collecting ground truth and validating that it works in different geographies on different pieces of hardware is a huge challenge. We also have issues with scale. This is a super fundamental service for Uber as a platform. You can imagine we're doing quite a bit of this. I don't have the 
number of hours of GPS data that we map match every day, but I imagine it's rather high. And so handling that effectively is a big challenge. And then lastly, of course, you know, the world being an uncertain place, we can't assume that our maps are perfect. In fact, when we do that, we wind up doing crazy stuff because if we're missing a road segment, we actually will like snap you and route you around some huge gap in the road network. And so solving a bunch of these challenges was really critical to deployment at scale. Fun fact, in 2015, we were actually certified as the first ever GPS-based commercial distance estimation device by the California Division of Measurement Standards. Um, they took a bunch of Uber apps, put them in cars, drove them around with taxi meters, and found that we were actually as or more accurate than the like physical piece of hardware sitting on the car's wheels measuring the odometer. It turns out tire pressure is actually super important there. People don't really think about that, but you know, if your uh, if your cab has higher pressure or lower pressure wheels, you'll actually get charged more or less. That's uh, that's drivers. Now riders are actually a huge issue too. So if you think about all the simplifying assumptions that we made in order to make the driver problem tractable, none of those apply to riders. Pedestrians can be anywhere in a city. They can actually be in the building, like that might be legit. And also errors are super expensive. I don't know, I'm sure you folks have experienced if you've ever taken out your phone, requested a ride, and then realized that, hey, the pin landed like down the other block. Super high friction experience for everyone involved. And so it's worth it to us to try to solve this problem. I don't have time to go into the details. We just put out an awesome blog post on this. I highly encourage everyone to check it out. Basically, we solve multipath directly. And so we actually maintain both 3D building models as well as ephemeris data, so the known satellite positions. We run a process called ray tracing where we actually draw lines from the satellites to the city surface to generate a probability surface for where you probably are based on satellite visibility. Again, taking into account the fact that there are actually these shields and mirrors. And then we use particle filters to evolve that estimate over time. And so you can see here, there's the red raw GPS, which is bouncing around like crazy and very expensively for Uber, you can see it's like totally on the wrong street or on the wrong side of the street. Um, and then the blue trace is actually the improved GPS that we wind up using for downstream decision making. So that's the sort of, uh, oh, and it's called shadow matching. Um, you should read the blog post to find out why it's super cool. That's the uh, location intelligence side of the house. I'm gonna talk now about sensor intelligence. And so sensor intelligence actually functions as a sort of hybrid platform consultancy. We partner really closely with partner teams, and we actually develop tailored inferences for their applications. So a couple examples. Safety is a really big thing on our platform. You know, we have a lot of drivers that are actually driving around all the time, and ensuring that the rider has a really comfortable experience in the vehicle is super important. And so we actually produce a whole slew of behavioral inferences on the data, and then use that as an educational tool for our drivers to help them understand what aspects of their driving might make passengers uncomfortable, and generally promote safe behavior on the platform. I'll talk a bunch about marketplace. You know, other folks talked on this, but obviously clear understanding of efficiency and exact behavioral interactions in these really complex spatial environments is a big challenge. And then also stuff like fraud. So not only do we see actual you know, adversarial behavior on the platform, we actually see spoofed sensors. So you can download the Mock Locations GPS app if you wanna you know, mess with Google Maps, and it'll actually breadcrumb in GPS for whatever trajectory you want. So using structural aspects of the data in order to detect this kind of malicious action is obviously super important for us as a business. Uh, there's some great articles about Pokemon Go GPS spoofing if you're interested, kind of fascinating. So I'll talk a bunch about Marketplace now. Other folks have already touched on this, but obviously ETAs are super critical for our business, both for the eater experience, because nobody likes being hungry. I'm sorry, I promise you, food is very close. And couriers and restaurants obviously are dependent on efficiency in order to make money on the platform. Challenge, of course, is that we don't observe all states. And so as Charlie mentioned, there's a typical life cycle for an Uber trip where the Uber courier is driving to the restaurant. They spend some amount of time actually looking for parking around the restaurant, picking up the food and all of that, which we actually don't fully understand. We don't actually get UI engagements with the app, you know, that says, hey, the courier's parked now or anything like that. They pick up the food and then they're driving to the eater and then they have to actually drop off the food. And so the Uber Eats team came to us and said, hey, you know, we have this complex interaction. We'd like to get more insight into what the sources of friction are, you know. Has the courier taken a long time to find parking? Were they waiting in the restaurant for a long period of time because the food wasn't ready? And so when you look at the actual timeline that they have, that they're trying to understand, there's an enormous blank gap in the middle, which they have no insight into. So we worked with them to structure the problem. You know, we, we figured like, okay, what are the actual latent states here that we're trying to infer for the business? And then we went out and we looked at all the sort of different time series signals that we had available. This is stuff like the location of the courier, obviously the context, like where the restaurant is, is super important. Um, we have the raw motion sensors from the driver app, and so we actually run an intermediate stage of inference on top of that, where we figure out what the current modality is, you know, inferring actually when the courier has switched from driving to walking is pretty important to know where you parked. 
And then in this case, we use one of our sequential models. So we're actually able to get away with a pretty simple one. It's a conditional random field, which is essentially a sequential version of a logistic regression. We can look at the whole structure of uh, atomic states and then infer the most likely change points based on, on the behaviors. And so we're able here to figure out you know, when and where the courier parks, how long it takes them to walk to the restaurant, dwell time in the restaurant, when they begin walking back out. And that allows us to paint a much richer picture of the world. And so this is, uh, you know, I order from Curry up now a lot, so I was kind of curious, it's on Valencia Street, I'd highly recommend it. I was curious, like, hey, you know, what's this restaurant look like? And so if you plot where couriers are parking, we see this interesting pattern where there's a lot of them parking, unsurprisingly, on Valencia Street. But we also see these clusters, these sort of outliers around the fringes. And so we're able to then understand, like, what's an actual optimal behavior here? It takes a lot less time to find a parking spot if you accept one of the further away clusters. But then as it turns out, if we look at how long it takes to actually walk to the restaurant, it takes a lot longer when you park further away. And so that's actually not an optimal decision. And so we wanna actually fix that. So Uber being Uber, tightly integrated with the physical world, we have city teams in these restaurants. And so we can actually make process improvements. So we'll identify the highest friction restaurants that are serving really large trip volumes and actually work with them directly in order to optimize the process. We can do things like find parking spots around the restaurant that couriers can use, or even just change the mechanics of the handoff for that restaurant. As Charlie mentioned, we can also do more system-wide fixes, like even just incorporating these estimates more effectively into other prediction algorithms, or multimodal transit, dispatching a bicyclist instead of a car. Challenges, there's a lot of challenges, again, which I just glossed over. Things like geospecific sequence variability are a huge issue. So we actually weren't uh, accounting for the fact that there are drive-throughs where the courier never leaves the car. Um, so that messed with the initial version of the model quite a bit, um, as well as things like malls, where a restaurant will actually be super deep in an indoor structure. We also have couriers on different modalities. So for example, we have couriers who are mostly on foot, but then will periodically take public transit just to mess with us. Um, labels, again, huge challenge. Here we've got some really interesting stuff going on with active learning. So you know, we'll take a targeted subsampling of trips that look weird or where we think our prediction's wrong or where there's some disagreement with another business metric and have a human look at the sensor trace and try to give us an idea about what happened. Um, we're also engaged with a bunch of cool weekly supervised learning. Again, you know, sort of using different data sources, looking for disagreement, training off noisy labels from UI engagements, things like that. And then honestly, one of the biggest things here is just bandwidth for additional use cases. And we'd love to give Eats more insight into drop off. We're working with a bunch of other teams on different applications around understanding pickups because pickups are super high friction too and also safety for, for various forms of anomaly detection. That's sensing and perception, you know, it's super fun. We, we are a platform at the team and on the, at the company. And so we get to work with a whole bunch of different teams on different types of challenges. It's everything from robotics to sort of classic machine learning. 